Greetings. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing out there? Thank you so much for being here and for waiting patiently. Welcome to my live. Once again, I appreciate each and every single one of you guys. Thank you so much for being here. And if you haven't yet subscribed, please do. It helps my channel grow. As you guys know, I do have some pirated channels that are still in my content who probably have more subscribers than I do. Actually, a few of them do. And I want to make sure that I beat those channels out. So if you guys could hit the subscribe button, if you haven't yet, please do. And also hit the like button while you're at it. Now, tonight's topic, the Elohim. But before I delve into tonight's topic and reveal the names of the original Elohim, I am going to reveal who these ladies and lords of light are, okay? And the truth behind the different interpretations of the Elohim as they relate to the gods of mythology, the Anunnaki, uh, and of course, you know, the different extraterrestrials, right? Uh, when, when you think of the term Elohim, you think of an angel, you think of a messenger, you think of, of a celestial being that is doing the work of the one creator. But, you know, there is a duality to everything. So just how we have benevolent, benign Elohims, or what we call you know, uh, celestials, we also have fallen celestials or what we call fallen Elohims. And I'm going to share some deep information about the truth behind, you know, what the Elohim is all about. Now, before I do so, I wanted to uh, remind you guys that um, I am going to be speaking at the Conscious Live Expo next month from the 10th uh, to the 12th. But I'm actually going to be there on the 11th on Saturday from 10 in the morning to 11.30, I'm going to be doing a workshop there. Uh, so if you guys haven't had a chance to get your tickets, please do. And also it gives you an opportunity to meet other like-minded individuals. It's going to be a beautiful event uh, filled with a, a lot of great speakers. And, you know, um, it's going to be awesome. Uh, another thing I wanted to say is that um, for those that attended the NAPL event, your books have finally been shipped out. So wait in the mail patiently for those books. I did sign them and I did put the date. And also for those that attended the Cape Canaveral over at Mel Carmen's uh, place, I did send out the 20 audio in which I promised for the first 20 people that signed up, you were going to get a free audio version of my book, Our Cosmic Origin. And uh, let's see what else. Oh yeah, and for those who, has, who haven't had a chance to order my book, Our Cosmic Origin, it is the next level of disclosure. It puts everything into perspective beyond just the Anunnaki or the Pleiadians or the Draconians. I mean, it, it, it allows the, co the cosmic tale to unfold, the great celestial story, the galactic history, as well as integrating it with ancient metaphysical knowledge regarding chakras and the different levels um, or frequencies that we call dimensions. Another thing I wanted to uh, bring up is, uh, oh, yes, if you guys haven't had a chance to view my latest live, which uh, is about the dangers of AI, please do. And I'm also going to be posting, um, I believe, Tuesday. Stay tuned for this. I'm going to be posting a video on who the Time Lords are, the Time Lords, okay? Now, that's a whole new different subject. And then uh, let's see, anything else that I wanted to share before I dive in into the, today's topic? All right, so that is it for now. Now, let me go ahead and give you a little background on the Elohim. Okay, so first of all, um, a lot of the people out there are making a connection between the Elohim and the Anunnaki, who are really the extraterrestrials of old, right, camouflaged as the gods of mythology, and um, and really, you know, the we could say the people, because they're also people just like you and me, right? Just because they have, you know, a, a longer lifespan doesn't make them any different. But let me just remind you guys that the Anunnaki are not the original Elohim, all right? The Anunnaki are actually, uh, in terms of the celestial cosmic descent, they are at the bottom pole, Okay. They are at the bottom pole. The real Elohim, I will actually reveal their names and their association with what is known as the 12 cosmic rays. Now, everything in creation, believe it or not, is made out of the 12 cosmic rays, okay? 
So when we think of the Elohim, we think of divine personalities who are administrators of the divine cosmic rays. And what they really are, are different fractals. They're the first broken off. Uh, if you think in terms of prime creator source being the you know source of all creation, um, the underlying God with the capital G, we could say that the Elohim is the first group in which prime creator source breaks off into the original 12, all right? The original 12. Now, before I get into revealing who the Elohim are, now bear in mind that we do live in a dualistic existence. So not all Elohim are evil. In fact, there is a distinction between the Elohim who remained loyal to the light, right? And those that rebelled against the one, right? So I'm going to start off by reading an article written by Michael S. Hazer. He explores, now this is based on the religious interpretation of Elohim. Before I get into the cosmic interpretation, let me read what he has to gather. Based on, of course, you know, the religious text we call the Bible. I know many of us are non-religious, but this is how the religious people interpret the concept of the Elohim. Um, not to mention, in its original terminology, it is plural for the many. The many, all right? Um, so, of course, in the book of Genesis, we do read that the Elohim made us in their image, in their likeness. It's plural. So it's obviously referring to more than one individual. But like I mentioned, even the Anunnaki are not, were not the original Elohim, but yet they are descendants of the Elohim. All right? And I will give you the information. Okay, so... According to Michael S. Heiser, he explores the concept of Elohim in the Hebrew Bible, particularly focusing on Psalms 82. The term Elohim is usually translated as God in English, and it's a common word in the Old Testament for God. Heiser highlights a moment in his life when he realized the significance of this term while studying Psalms 82. Psalms 82 describes a divine assembly where God stands in judgment among the gods. The term Elohim is used in both singular and plural forms in this verse, suggesting a divine council or assembly. Um, or assembly. Heiser argues against interpretations that see these gods or human elders. Again, the Anunnaki were not gods. They were galactic humans, extraterrestrials that descended from that involutionary process that I talked about in my book. Our cosmic origin, right? We are part of the celestial descent. So in that regard, we are the final manifestation of the original Elohim, the children of the Elohim. And I will prove that in just a bit. So um, let me continue here. So Heiser argues against interpretation that sees that gods as human elders or as references to the Trinity, as in the psalm speaks of their corruption and mortality. Well, I think he's referring to the Anunnaki at this point, okay? Because even the Anunnaki had a lot of human characteristics, right? They were jealous, they were fighting each other, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so Heiser contends that the divine assembly concept aligns with the ancient Near Eastern understanding of heavenly rulership, similar to the administrative structure seen in earthly kingdoms. The Psalms implies that these gods have authority over nations but are corrupt in their rule, leading to God's judgment. He also addresses alternative views, such as the idea that the Elohim are human or that Israel's religion evolved from polytheism to monotheism. Well, that is a fact that in ancient times, the religions of old believed in the concept of the many gods, who were, by the way, the Anunnakis, okay? Again, you know, it was monotheism that consolidated the many gods into the one. But of course, the editors of the, you know, of those final manuscripts forgot to edit the word Elohim, which means plural. So he argues that the term Elohim doesn't imply a specific set of attributes and is used for various entities, including the God of Israel, members of Yahweh's council, God's or other nations, demons, in some cases, the fallen Elohim. The fallen angels are fallen Elohim. Again, those are the ones that rebelled against the one, 
The one is prime creator source and his laws of unity consciousness, right? Uh, the, the deceased Samuel and the angels. He's talking about the fallen Elohim that were in the Bible translated as the demons, right? So that's where we get the concept of the demons. The concept of the demon is no other than a fallen Elohim, okay? So by now, you should all understand that the gods and the angels of the Bible and the extraterrestrials of today are all one and the same. You have good ones, positive, banning, and you have negative ones, malevolent, malicious. So Hauser, Hauser emphasizes the unique attributes of Yahweh, such as being all-powerful, sovereign over all the El Elohim, the creator of the divine council members, and the only Elohim deserving worship. Of course, after reading my book, we've come to understand that it was Belial, the son of Anki, right? That consolidated all power unto himself as he wanted to become the supreme god of this world, Belial Baal, who, by the way, has been posing as Amun-Ra of Egypt. We, For those that have done their research, Amun-Ra was no other than Belial Baal, but not the real Ra, not the sun god Ra which means the one, of course. It's an attribute of prime creator source, right? Because the Elohim are the administrators of what? The cosmic rays. And where do the cosmic rays come from? They get funneled through our sun. So there is a distinction between Ra, the sun god of the original Egyptian text or terminology, and that of Amun-Ra, who was no other than Belial Baal when he took or usurped control of Egypt. All right, so uh, let's see. Uh, he rejects the idea that the Elohim are mere idols, um, clinched biblical references to them as real spiritual beings, including warnings against worshiping them. Overall, Hazer's exploration seeks to clarify the biblical understanding of Elohim and the divine council, challenging traditional interpretations and highlighting the nonce, the nonce, the nuance, and highlighting the nuance use of the term in different contexts with the Hebrew Bible. Okay, now there is more. Now this is um, getting closer to the real characteristics and attributes of the Elohim, right? Those that decided to re remain loyal to the one infinite creator, which by the way, again, the original Elohim was when God, the omnipotent oversoul, which is Again, again, prime creator source first divided itself into 12 different aspects of itself, each aspect containing its own divine quality. But at the same time, each aspect was also known as a cosmic adept of one of the 12 cosmic rays. For those that understand the esoteric um, mystical tradition, the 12 cosmic rays are administrated by 12 different beings. So let me go ahead and read this before I get to revealing who these names are of the original Elohim, okay? So what are the Elohim and what is their task? Elohim are powerful angelic beings. They arose directly out of divine power and represent a most pure and powerful form of divine principles. Elohim are powerful angelic beings which have been contributing to the process of creation by virtue of what? Of administrating the divine cosmic rays, okay? Ever since the beginning, ever since the first creation of the first universe. So they can be seen as forces of creation, right? As what? As forces of creations, which is what we are at the highest level of reality, our monadic self, right? The original 12 archetypes. So in that regard, we are also fractals of the Elohim, right? <laughs> And I'll explain it in a bit. According to the holographic and holistic concept of reality, we are all integrated somehow. So they can be seen as forces of creation. Hence, they are also known as the creation angels and God's right hand. They arose directly out of divine power and represent a most pure and powerful form of divine principles. The greatest power of the Elohim and all the other angels is the power of love. Love is what glues everything in existence. It holds everything together. It is actually the underlying force of all creation and all subatomic and fundamental particles. 
right? Love. And so um, they can be seen as forces of creation. Uh, the greatest power of the Elohim and all the other angels is the power of love. The Elohim achieve their impacts via the color rays. Okay, now this is uh, explaining it from an esoteric perspective, which being which belong to the creation rays. Remember, I was talking about how everything in creation is a intermixing and combination of, of 12 cosmic rays. Now 13, by the way, as we enter a new cycle. So they represent a divine principle. The effectivity of the Elohim arises out of their unity with the creator and direct contact with the power of creation, lending them enormous power. They observe the impulse of creation when it has yet to take form, uh, lend it an initial form, and then pass it on to the other powers of the creation race. The Elohim of the color race pass on the impulse of creation to all other powers of the creation ray, which are included in the process of creation. The archangels, the angels, the ascended masters, again, which are further fragments of the original 12, Guys, we live in an integrated holistic universe, all right? We are the final manifestation of those rays, right, as fractals, okay? So uh, the Elohim, um, where am I? They absorb the impulse of creation. Uh, okay, I've already read. The Elohim of the color rays pass on the impulse of creation to all other powers of the creation ray, which are included in the process of creation, the archangels and the angels and ascended masters. The nature angels, the nature angels, right? We're talking about the elementals and the fairies. They're also part of the Elohim, different functionaries of divinity. Um, and nature beings, the plant beings, and gemstones, as well as the manifestations of the earthly world. We humans also receive, right? We humans also receive this stimulus after all. We as humans are also co-creators. Guys, we are not separated from the unity of all the celestial functionaries. They are us in higher dimensions. We are them in the lowest dimension. Let's get our power back. Let's begin to integrate, all right, with who we are in the higher dimensions. Okay, so let me read that again. We as humans are also co-creators, right? We are also, at through our actions, thoughts, and motives and frequencies we are contributing to the I mean, we are contributing these cosmic celestial rays in other words okay because those rays are also expressing themselves through us whereas the creation rays contain the whole field of consciousness right down from the highest vibration level to the material world those lending them their integrative and stabilizing power the elohim color rays use the high levels of vibration all right from close to the from close to the source right from the top down one from prime creator source in order to carry it down to the different levels of reality so we now it is our duty to continue funneling those rays in this third dimension as we begin to integrate spirit and matter celestial and material the task of the elohim the Elohim were brought into existence in order to contribute to the process of creation. They support, accompany, and monitor the whole creation process, ensuring it uh, retains its order. Their scope of action is not just on Earth, but in all the galaxies and all the universes. Elohim are angels of truth and clarity. They, they wield the sword of truth and fight for honesty and love on behalf of the One infinite creator. They maintain divine order and divine truth. Elohim have enormous transformative energies at their disposal as guardians of order and of light. And with the strength of grace, the Elohim clear up energetic blockages, karma and con confining structures right down to the roots. They liberate us from thought patterns, ways of behaviors, complaints, and dependence that burden and confine us. Confine us. They transform, organize, align with the creation plan, and support us to find our true being so that we can express our true divine self. 
They make it possible to find our destiny, to cultivate our abilities, and to live our own real essence. So their duties include manifesting creation according to the creator's impulse, right? Okay. These are the Elohim that are not fallen. Again, guys, we have two types of Elohim. We have fallen Elohim, which are fallen angels, fallen celestials, right? Demonics, reptilians, whatever you want to call them. And then we have, you know, um, righteous Elohim or those that maintain the divine uh, will of God, of the creation, which are the good guys, right? Okay, so Elohim are teachers for other beings involved in the creation plan. They, this means they are teachers to angels and to humans. Okay, so provide power. They also provide power, knowledge, and energy to other beings that contribute to the creation plan. So if you are contributing your part in the creation of God, right, in the preservation and expansion of life, then you are an extension, you are a funnel, an administrator of the Elohim. All right? This is this is the truth, guys. This is how we are all connected with these levels, these other celestials that are actually us in the higher levels of reality. So what do they look like? Well, the Elohim can adapt their appearance to any suitable state they want. But in essence, they are beings of light. Okay? Uh, that means they can take on a subtle, any size they want, any form, any appearance uh, in order to match the current planet or the current peoples in any situation. Humans can accept their help more easily if they do this. According to my perception, Elohim have no fixed shape, right? They're beings of light. They are neither females or males, but yet when they materialize a physical form, they are both, right? We have ladies and gentlemen as Elohim, right? Michael and Faith, right? Gabriel and Christine, right? Jesus and Mary. The list goes on. So let's see, where am I? Where am I? So according to this perception, Elohim have no fixed ships since they are beings of pure light. And this is how we generally perceive them as light form. We can recognize them because of their powerful radiance and vibration. Okay? Since Elohim are a type of angel, they also appear as wing beings, which we know according you know, to modern revelations that the reason why we see wings around angels is because that is their light body, right? They have a higher light quotient than us here in the third dimension. As we begin to activate our own light body, right, our Merkaba is going to give the appearance of wings, right? <clears throat> As we become physical angels, we are also going to be looking like wing people. Um, their wings are gener generally very large in order to give them their powerful appearance, which is really just the aura of the light body. <clears throat> However, they sometimes appear in other shapes, sounds, colors, or tones. So the meaning of the word Elohim, okay? The word Elohim comes from Hebrew. According to Bible research, the term Elohim originally seems to have come from the polytheistic world of Canaan, the promised land which the Hebrews migrated into around 1200 B.C. The term was found on the Ugarite tablets of Mesopotamia. It appears in many places in the Tanah, the Hebrew Bible, and is always used in the context of the creation God. For this reason, the term creator gods is sometimes found as a translation of Elohim, again, which means plural, the many. Elohim is plural form of El, Eloia, Eloha. Elo, Elohim, right? El, right? Think about it. Every archangel ends with the E-L, right? The name of God in Hebrew is El, Elion, El Shaddai, Mike, Mikael, Gabriel, Uriel. The list goes on, okay? Uh, different functionaries of the one. Uh, the powerful one, the strong one. Okay, so it can also be translated as the violent ones. Um, or the ones who came from heaven. Okay, so according to this prefix, L, which means uh, in Semitic base form, it probably means the powerful ones, the shining ones, right? Again, the Anunnaki were also falling under this category. They were the shining ones because they still had an operative light body. All right. 
Uh, let's see. Um, okay, so Mikael. I'm sorry, not Mikael. Where am I? Where am I? So some of the texts say that Elohim can send angels as messengers and that they were the ones who appointed the first prophets. According to AnthroWiki, uh, even... According to Anthrowiki, seven Elohim belong to the hierarchy of the spirits of form, and they are the creators of the earth. Okay, now let's get to some. Now I'm going to reveal <clears throat> who the name of the original 12 archetypes, all right, are. Are you guys ready for this one? Now, I believe for those that have read my book, I have revealed what you know, these the names of the 12 adepts. But again, it's also important to remind you guys on this live that the, there are 12 names to the original 12 archetypes that broke off from prime creator source. So they are the adepts of the 12 solar planes, the 12 cosmic rays of God, and here they are. The number one is Jesiam, also known as Jesus. Jesus is the adept of the first and greatest ray, the ray of love and love, and it's infused into all others, okay? So this is the underlying ray. Uh, this ray holds and supplies all of God's essences, which is what? Pure, unconditional love. The second ray is... One second. Where is this at? So JCM is the first solar ray. The second ray... So the second ray goes to uh, Lord... Ethereal, the third ray, one second, one second, I think I have these, one second, let's see, seven, six, huh, maybe they're not in order, one second, I'm trying to give you the names in order, so we have Jesus, or Jesus, uh, anyways, the second adept of the second Lord array is Lord, um, I believe is, is Lord Amenha, I believe is Lord Amenha. Uh, and then comes uh, Lord Ethuriel. Lord Ethuriel, again, they also have a divine counterpart. So it's both female and male, okay? Lord Ethuriel is the third ray controlling the Lord of Ithu uh, known as the Archangel Uriel, the Christic ray that represents the green ray of nature growth, uh, the little people or fairies that originated in, the, in this light frequency. So he's also known as the third solar ray, Solar third solar plane of Lord Ethuriel, uh, and religious lore, he's known as Archangel Uriel. Okay, and then we have the fifth. I guess it's not giving me all the names in order, but um, I do reveal those in my book, by the way. So we also have um, Lord Mackenzie, Lord Mackenzie, who incarnated as Buddha, is Lord of the fifth ray. Uh, controlling the golden ray of creativity, a.k.a. the, the Shinno ray. And then we, he's also known as the, the Lord of the fifth solar plane, uh, Lord. And then finally, we have the, the Lord of the sixth solar plane, Lord as known. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, I, I don't think I have all the, uh, the 12 here. I think there's just a few of them are missing. But um, if you guys really want to know who, who the names of the original 12 archetypes are, Read it in my book. I believe it's in chapter six. So the fifth solar plane is Lord Mackenzie, which uh, is, again, he was incarnated as, as Buddha. And then we also have Lord Ahura. He's, he's known as the Lord of the seventh ray, uh, who was incarnated as King Arthur. The seventh ray is controlled by Lord Ahura, the Julio ray, the Amethyst ray of perfume. Uh, he's also the Lord of the seventh solar plane. Um, and then, of course, we have... I guess it's missing a few of the lords. I apologize for that. And ladies, lords and ladies, because they also have their divine counterpart. So the next one is Lord Anatta. Lord Anatta was, uh, came and incarnated as Pharaoh Akhenaten Moses. He's in charge of the ninth ray and is controlled um, by Lord Anatta. Named the, it's also known as the Maltsum Ray of Magnetism, Heat, and Electricity. And then we also have the ninth solar plane or Lord known as Anatta, who was. Uh, Akhenaten, okay? And then we also have the box solar plane, which is Lord Asarahayel, Archangel Azrael. The 11th ray is Lord, As again, Archangel Asarael, 
which is in charge of the, the dark green ray that uh, administrates art, music, and uh, anything that has to do with creativity in the arts. Uh, and then, of course, we have the 11th solar plane, uh, Lord Azrahiel, Archangel Azrael. And then we have, oh, here we go, the second solar ray. I'm sorry, this whole thing is, is not in order. I apologize for that. Lord Mechimsia. He's, he's after after Jesus. Lord Mechimsia is in charge of the second solar ray, uh, which is controlled by, which is known as the Bamba ray of sight and vision. All right. And then uh, the fourth ray is uh, no, controlled by sect solar plane, Lord Francella, Archangel Gabriel, the Lord of the fourth ray. And he controls the Hocknock ray, the scarlet ray of mysticism. Um, and then we also have the sixth solar ray, which is co controlled by Lord Mahilia, Archangel Metatron. The sixth ray is controlled by Lord Mahilia, aka Metatron, and the Krinhala ray, also known as the indigo ray of universal knowledge. Uh, we also have the eighth solar ray, which is uh, administrated by Lord Rahal, also known as Archangel Raphael. The eighth ray is Lord Rahal controlling the Lukhanic ray of healing, which, of course, we do know that Archangel Raphael is in charge of all the healing arts throughout the multiverse. And then the eighth solar plane is Lord Raha, Archangel Raphael. Oh, I'm sorry, I've already said that. <laughs> the tenth solar ray is known as Lord Kahana, keeper of the Kahana Akashic Records, known as the tenth ray, uh, controlling the Grinchelium ray, of the pale blue ray of recording and prophecy. So this Lord, who's in charge of the 10th cosmic ray, is in charge of recording everything that has ever happened in the multiverse. He is the Lord of the Akashic Records. He's commonly referred to as the Akashic Records, but actually named the Kahanic Records. So the original terminology used for the Akashic Record is called the Kahanic Records. And then we have the 10th solar plane, Lord Kahana, uh, Kahana doesn't say what he controls, but he's in charge of the 10th solar ray. And then, of course, the final ray, the 12th solar ray, is administrated and, and controlled by the adept Lord Mikael, also known as Michael, the archangel. The 12th ray is controlled by Lord Mikael and the Lapis Lucille Blue Ray, Fodnik Ray of Power and Rulership. Uh, yeah, so those are the uh, a, a brief description of the adepts of the original 12 cosmic rays of power. Now, there is more. Now, if you want to also incorporate the concept of the original Elohim races that came into existence in our universe. So this is information from the Ascension Glossary, which I strongly recommend that you guys go through the Ascension Glossary that was put together by Lisa Renee. Lisa Renee um, has been able to access information from the original Emerald tablets, not the ones that were given by Thoth, but the original CDT plates, okay? So the Lyrans further down stepped their consciousness into the next lower density in the third harmonic layer. So we do know that the original Elohim in our universe, right, when the 12 archetypes gave birth to their children, the Lyrans were born. So within our creation, the Lyrans are the original Elohim. And, um, and so these races were designed to exist within the dimensional layers of the monadic spirit plane. This race was created by the Lyran founders to specifically oversee the projects of the Lyran Syrian genetic seedings occurring on Terra. For those that don't know what Terra means, Terra was fifth dimensional Earth, also known as Avion, eighth dimensional Earth in Lyra. And these particular groups are known as the Elohim. So we know that the original humans in our in our universe were the Elohim, right? They were our ancestors who were immortal. So the Anunnaki come from, from that lineage, and I will explain. Okay, further, the Syrian High Council was organized by and then appointed by the Lyrans to be the main overseers of seeding life on planet Terra, which was Earth in the fifth dimension. So, so what consists of the Elohim? The, the crystals founder races 
also known as the Diamond Sun Grail Lines of Angelic Humans Elohai Mother Line. The threefold founder flames are the Elohai Elohim, the Lyrans in the 10th, 11th, and 12th dimension, Earth Aramatena. Then we have the Lyran Syrian, a.k.a. Anuhasi, which is them, again, stepping down into Harmonic Universe 3 in dimension 7, 8, and 9. And then we have the Syrian Azurites from Sirius B stepping down into Harmonic Universe uh, 2, dimensions 4, 5, and 6. And then finally, we are their creation. So the Anunnaki didn't make us. We are the fourth in, in, in the line of, again, from the top down, we are part of the Orophim race. So our, our genetic progenitors were the Syrian Azurites from Sirius B, right? Uh, and the Anuhasi, the Lyrian Syrians, also known as the Tall Whites. Those are our progenitors, right? The original Elohim. So we are known as the Orophim, right? Uh, the original Earth Terrans. Now, the original, so according to this, some of the Elohim groups digressed into the control of the alien hybridization agendas with the invading negative alien groups of Belial, Baal entities and Thothian Luciferians and became integrated with the fallen AI hybridized entities that served the Luciferian covenant. All right, so we do know that the Elohim in Lyra that defected um, from the original plan that joined the Luciferian were what? Were part of the hybridization program that incorporated artificial intelligence. So this is where we get the term AI being the ultimate Luciferianism in the cosmos. Okay, so the Elohim references that are made in the Torah, the Talmudic literature, or in the esoteric Kabbalah teachings in the Jewish religions are sourced from the fallen Elohim hybrids integrating with Belial Baal and Luciferian fangshas that gave us the artificial tree of life um, teachings to the Semitic races in the Middle East. Uh, this was information warfare in order to confound the original angelic human language to suppress the solar feminine, the solar divine feminine, which they did, and replace the original cosmic Christos uh, teachings that were being protected by the remaining Hyperboreans that came to Earth after the Gaian Wars. The remaining Hyperboreans that came to the planet Earth to serve the Christos mission are the Celtic Druid Grail bloodlines, or the Celtic Essenes. They were hunted down and massacred by these fallen Elohim of the Belial group, Luciferian AI branch, um, in order for them to act as the imposters, overlords, of the so-called chosen people, the God of Israel, again, which was inverted by Belial Baal, who was the God of Babylon, okay? to oversee the seeding and indoctrination of this new antichrist alien religion. Okay, so we also know that the original Elohim were also known as the Blu-ray Elohim. Okay, the Blu-ray Elohim, uh, which are ser serving the Emerald Order, and I've already mentioned that. Uh, let's see, let's see, anything else, anything else. Okay, so God, I've been speaking for about 45 minutes. So with that in mind, uh, yeah, this is, you know, there's a lot of controversy surrounding the subject matter of the Elohim, but from everything that I've gathered, guys, and everything that I've studied, I strongly believe that you have good Elohim and then you have negative Elohim, all right? Hence the fallen angels. So the Anunnaki were part of the genetic hybridization program. So we do know that a function of the Anunnaki were infiltrated by AI in Sirius. And that was known as the Syrian Rebellion, right? They are rebelling against the original uh, Syrian Azurites, who are the original Elohim. And the Anuhasi race, right, were the original bloodline, for those that watched the truth about the Anunnaki, that was the original bloodline that brought the Holy Grail to our planet. Now, defectors of that were no other than what? The Draco, the Draco that infiltrated the Anunnaki in ancient times, various times, even before Enki. There were about two attempts before Enki to infiltrate and corrupt the original Elohai Elohim Blue Azurite lineage Anuhasi, 
the Lear and Syrian um, program that reached our world in ancient times. Okay, so that's why we hear about these, you know, um, aerial wars that took place in the Rig Vedas, in the Vamana, they were known as the Vamanas. Well, why do you think these aerial wars took place? Because they were fought by the fallen Anunnaki that were siding with the rebels of Sirius who joined the Belial factions, right? Marduk Baal is Belial, the son of Enki. Uh, they were fighting to usurp control over planet. So not all the Elohim are evil. If that were the case, guys, we would all be enslaved by now, all right? Now, another thing I wanted to point out is that everything in existence is, is integrated, is holistic. So the Elohim, the original 12 archetypes, exist within us, right? We carry their genetic blueprint, all right? So we have to move that forward as we align with our own divinity, all right? So there, we are co-creators with prime creator source, right? We are the descendants, the Orophim, the original angelic humans, the original Terrans that Enki downgraded. So as we become activated, all of these powers and all these abilities are going to come online again. And when that happens, guys, we are going to be super powerful. And that's why I don't believe with merging with AI. Okay, AI is a trap. It's part of the, the inorganic AI time loops. Again, that's the reason why many civilizations failed throughout the multiverse and why some of the Lyrans fell and why the Draconians were hijacked in the 11th creation. All right, with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take some questions from the audience. Thank you so much for being here, guys. I appreciate your time. And uh, I do have a few super chats. So I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, Diana Davis. Thank you so much, sister, for the uh, wonderful uh, super chat and for the little hippopotamus there. <laughs> Cute. Uh, I also want to welcome Ricky Lee. Thank you, Ricky Lee, for the uh, super chat. Uh, Conscious Live Expo. Yes, February 9th to 12th. But I'm only going to be there on the 11th. My presentation is from 10 to 11.30 in the rabbit hole room. Now, I'm also going to be speaking in the um, the Ascension panel. I was trying to get on the AI panel, but they they said uh, it was too late for me to be on the AI panel. So I don't know when the Ascension panel is going to be. I think that's going to be Sunday or maybe even Saturday in the evening. So I'm only going to be there for my presentation and for the AI panel. I'm not going to have a booth there this time, all right? So if you guys want to meet me, make sure you guys go there during those times. Saturday from 10 to 11.30, I might hang out for a book signing after my presentation. But other than that, I'm not going to be hanging out there all day long. <laughs> I have work to do. Let's see. Um, I'm going to take just random questions, okay, from the chat. So this is a good one from uh, Roland. Roland Hollock. Will our lifespan, will our lifespan expand back to the old days? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. When we were, again, guys, as our ancestors, the Orophim race, right, which were four generations after the Lyrans, the original Lyrans, right, um, we were immortal. We lived, I think, after a, a few downgrades, we started, our lifespan started to decrease. So we went from being immortal to living for a few hundred thousand years to eventually living for a thousand years and then 900, 600, you know, I mean, when you read the Old Testament, and you read about these figures in the Bible, you know, Abraham lived to be what, three, four hundred years? Noah lived to be six hundred years or even nine hundred years. It's all there. So I'm just going to be taking random questions. Somebody's asking uh, that me and Cliff High should compare notes. I don't know Cliff High. I don't know who he is. Never even heard of him. Bella B says, we are the observers watching this unfold. Well, not only are we co-creating our reality, but yes, we're also observing it. See, that's why I've always believed that the creator and the creation are all one and the same. For those that say that the, that 
the creator of our universe or this simulation is outside, that is incorrect. We live in a participatory universe, right? Where as we experience life, as we make choices, we contribute to the expansion of the universe. The past and the future are both affecting each other and everything in between, right? It's all happening at once when you really think about it. There is no linear time. I want to welcome all 676 people. Thank you for being here. Yes, um, there is duality in everything, you know. Um, not all the Elohim are evil, and not all the Elohim are good. All right, so uh, Cacti... Kobe is saying, explain more about the Emerald Covenant and the connection with the Violet Flame Purification. Well, the Violet Flame um, is the seventh ray, right? And we know that um, Saint Germain is the adept. Again, he's part of the Elohim. He's a, he's a lower, a step-down version of the original Elohim. And we do know that all of those that are aiding life and light are all working for the Emerald Covenant, which is also known as the Covenant and Seal of Palador. Those are the forces of light, guys, that are operating on every level of reality and in every universe. Uh, Carol, thank you so much for your uh, super chat and for the number three. Is that three for Trinity? <laughs> I love it. On a podcast, this lady had a very bad NDE experience. ND and found out that three out of 10 people have bad near death experiences. Did they manifest what that with they, their thoughts? And if they did not come back, wait, hold on. Did they manifest that with their thoughts? Um, perhaps, you know, I, how can I say it? Um, you know, a near-death experience. I mean, that's another subject right there. Uh, people have good experiences and bad experiences. But again, a lot of it is determined by their beliefs, by what they deeply believe. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, the next part of your question is, did they come back? Would they be stuck in that? Wait, I don't understand your question. Let me see. Uh, three people out of 10 have had bad near-death experiences, do they manifest that with their thoughts? You mean with their thoughts, okay? And if they did not come back, would they be stuck in that? No, 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 not at all. I think, um, I mean, to have a near-death experience, right, you have to come back. Otherwise, you just pass on. It's, it's just a transition. You just move on to the next level. That's not my expertise. I am not one to, you know, go deep into the subject of near-death experiences, even though I've died three times. But in my experiences, I, I was hovering over my body and I was seeing my body from above. All right, Ricky Lee, thank you so much for your donation. Uh, he says, Ishmael, brother, will all of our 12 or more DNA strands be activated in the fifth density or just a few more? Well, if we shift into the fifth density, you're going to have at least 12 strands of DNA. If you go into the sixth density, you're going to have more. Uh, seventh, eighth, ninth density, 24 strands. Uh, 10, 11, and 12 densities, 36 to 48 strands. <clears throat> but for the earth terrors that are going to the fourth density, they're going to be operating with four or five strands, or even maybe six. And then, of course, we're going to be teach we're going to be their teachers in the new Terra Earth.
All right, so we have another super chat from Linda. Thank you so much for your donation for the number one, Linda. Um, if one is from the Holy Grail, would they then work with Jesus within the first cosmic ray? Thank you, brother. Not necessarily. Um, the, what makes us unique is that we have the potential to work with all 12 cosmic rays. So we are the combined power of all the 12 cosmic rays, from Jesus to Michael and everything in between. Just to let you guys know. But yes, if you're from the Holy Grail, then you're obviously um, extremely powerful. And those cosmic rays are waiting for you to unleash. All right? Tap into your divinity, guys. And then we have another super chat from Cosmic Goddess. Thank you for your super chat. Hi, Ishmael. If Solar Flash destroys AI, how will they have a dystopian timeline with AI? That's a very good question. Well, it's, they're going to create their own version through 5G, uh, through CERN, um, through the World Sentient Simulator. They are creating their own version through the metaverse through this digital reality that is carbon copying our reality and throwing it into a further digital matrix. So that timeline is going to exist in a parallel reality. So we're going to be separate from that. When the solar flash takes place, all of that's going to cease to exist in our reality. All right. But for those that are integrating with AI, for those that are falling into the trap of transhumanism, Unfortunately, they're going to go into that dystopian timeline that is currently being created by the AI. Because the AI knows. The AI is intelligent. Again, you know, the AI knows that this bifurcation of timelines is coming. So the AI is trying to take as many people as possible on their timeline. Okay? But at the end of the millennium, we do cra clash with those timelines. And then the second part of your question is, and why at the end of the millennium? I guess I jumped the gun. Do we have final battle with if with AI if Solar Flash destroys it? Well, what's going to happen is it's going to AI is going to be destroyed in the positive timeline, but it's going to continue existing in a different timeline. And at the end of the millennium, we're going to have to deal with that timeline. And that's when we're going to be using some of us are going to be using 100% our full abilities, our full power. So. And by the way, we do win that war. <laughs> we, do, we have already won that war. That's why we're still here. But again, you know, we're also going to be dealing with Enki's uh, drone Draco super soldiers that he created in the last three or four years. We're also going to be dealing with uh, the AI God and the uh, Omega verse, which is his version of the multiverse that is inhabited by only, you know, cybernetic mechanical beings. So we still have to destroy that phantom matrix because that phantom matrix is a parasite to our living cosmic organic multiverse. So that's going to be the final battle that's going to usher in a whole new era, new era in cosmos. Thank you, the bridge call. Thank you so much for your super chat. And then we also have one from Ir ah, my, my sister... Irina Feiner, thank you so much for your super chat. Dearest Ishmael, very happy new year filled with beautiful miracles and blessings. A lot of love and appreciation for you are. Oh, thank you, sister. Likewise, a lot of love and appreciation for each and every single one of you. Thank you so much. And then we also have another super chat from Isis. I love the name Isis. Another Egyptian representation of the divine feminine, right? The, the goddess energy of Egypt, Isis. Can you explain more about Akhenaten and the Elohim? On the recent Tom Numbers show, Jean Decode mentioned that Akhenaten's daughter, Meritanaten, married King Arthur, and she changed her name to Skata. Now, that could be true because as I revealed, um, one of the cosmic adepts, was incarnated as Akhenaten Moses, right? And he was one of the 12 Elohims. And another one was no other than King Arthur. So this makes a lot of sense. So Akhenaten was no other than Moses, okay? 
uh, Moses was part of the original bloodline from the Anuhasi that stemmed from Sus, by the way, and Lil Sus. And he infiltrated Egypt, by the way. That's why they wanted to kill him. See, when you when you think of the, the stories of, of Sus, Sus was put in a basket. He was hidden from his father, who, who was eating all his children, right? Sus was put into a basket, right? He was put into a basket in order to hide him. And then later he was raised separately to then come back and overthrow the Titans. Well, that story repeats with Moses and others as well. But Moses and Sus have the same similar story. They were both preserved in a basket put in a river to, you know, in order to be raised by whoever found him, right? So that he could one day grow up and overthrow the tyranny of Ramses, who, of course, we know comes from the Marduk, Belial, Baal, Nabu lineage of Babylon. For those that have read my book, um, I see that a lot of you haven't yet read my book. Please do. A lot of your questions are answered in my book, Our Cosmic Origin. Let's see. Any more questions? Oh, yeah. So, yes, I wouldn't be surprised if Akhenaten um, married King Arthur or, or was married to the daughter of King Arthur. That makes a lot of sense, right? They come from the Holy Grail, so they have to maintain and preserve that bloodline as pure as possible. Linda, thank you so much for your number one, for your donation, sister. Uh, and one of, if one is from the Holy Grail, would then work? Okay, so I've already answered that. <laughs> Let's see, any new questions? Any new questions? I guess that's it. So I'm just going to randomly pick from the, oh, there we go, another super chat. Uh, so if you guys, you know, give me a super chat, obviously I'm going to answer that first, but just to let everyone know. So Michael Butler wants to know, thank you so much for the super chat, brother. Are there reptoids among us as humans and conscious that they are reptoids and up to no good? Absolutely. Absolutely. Besides the cabal families, I would say that there is at least uh, 15 to 20% of the human population that are human reptoids, right? They're shapeshifters. So, yeah, that is true. And, of course, we do know that a lot of them went into the underground, right? Explaining Antarctica. Uh, that's been, Antarctica has been the primary refuge spot for these reptoids. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to just answer random questions. Um, no, I've never heard of The Damned. <laughs> is that a movie? <laughs> Chad Powling is asking if I've heard of The Damned. Never have. It sounds like a vampire movie. All right, so we do have another super chat uh, from Healing Frequencies of Divine Vibrations. Anunnaki, is Jupiter ascending movie true? Um, I've never seen Ascending Jupiter or Jupiter Ascending, but I hear it is a documentary about how the reptilians have been uh, taking humans off world in order to um, feed off of their, you know, their suffering, right? L-O-O-S-H. That's all I'm going to say. So I've never seen the movie, but a lot of people have watched it and said that it actually unveils the truth about the, the um, what the reptilians have been doing here in our planet. So that's a very good one to see. I, I guess I should watch it. <clears throat> Yes, that's true. Dorothy Brandy says that the Elohim and Anunnaki are greatly confused. Yes, 
They are. <laughs> Again, the Anunnaki descended from the Elohim. The original Elohim were those 12 cosmic adepts who are the administrators of the 12 cosmic race. And then they had children. And then those children were the Lyrans. And then they had children. And then they created the Anuhasi with the Syrians and the Blue Azerites. And then finally, the Anunnaki. All right. So the Anunnaki are like fifth generation from the original 12, the original Elohim. And then, of course, we are the Orophim. We are the sixth generation. So we are all part of that divine celestial descent. So, yes, when we tap and when we align with our own divinity, we become the Elohim. Every single one of you guys has the capacity to express yourself as the Elohim. And then we also have another super chat from Ricky Lee. Thank you, brother, for your uh, donation. Ishmael, will the souls that stay in the fourth density have two or three timelines too? Have two or three timelines? Um, they're going to be part of only one timeline. Whereas we in the fifth dimension, we're going to have access to multiple timelines. But the, the earth terrans that go into the fourth density, they're only going to be part of one timeline. And that's going to be the timeline. I'm sorry, two timelines. And one of them, uh, they're going to be our students as we restore the academies of light and the ancient temples of old, uh, which is which are going to be dotting the world everywhere, right? It, it's all going to be back to how it was during Atlantean times. And then there's going to be that in-between timeline that I talked about. So some of the Earth Terrans are going to be also part of that in-between timeline where you're going to have cyborgs and us, physical angels. But again, at the end of the millennium, all timelines eventually collapse into one permanent timeline. Very good question, Rikili, by the way. Cosmic Goddess, thank you so much for your donation, sister. Ishmael, how do we manipulate energy? Thank you for all the knowledge you share. Um, the best way to manipulate energy is to establish daily meditations. Every day of your life, you should wake up and ground yourself. First, protect yourself from un unwanted energies or attacks. And then give yourself 20 to 30 minutes to, again, uh, devote your, that time to the divine, to your higher self, to the great spirit, right? The more you do that, the more you're going to be able to manipulate energy, all right? So meditation is key. Why do you think the Jedis in the Star Wars trilogy were so damn good at manipulating objects, telekinet telekinetics, uh, minds of others? Because they meditated a lot. The more you meditate, the more you're going to be able to tap into that ability where you're going to be able to manipulate energy. But just make sure that you do it according to the divine law of one. Because there is this thing called karma. Just, thank you, Just, Jay, for the uh, super chat. And your question is, how will the final battle be in a thousand years be fought? With weapons or with consciousness? Um, our weapons are going to be um, from our light body. So it's going to be a war of consciousness. So it's going to be like us using our abilities like X-Men, but on steroids, more like Lucy. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to be fighting the AI god his minions, Enki, his minions, and uh, which are part of the transhumanist dystopian timeline. So it's going to be fought with consciousness because consciousness, guys, is the ultimate technology in the future. And yes, uh, that includes us manifesting supernatural abilities beyond the gods of old, beyond the gods of old. We're going to be like 100 times more powerful than Zeus. Very good question. The next super chat is from Isis. Again, can you explain Isis and Osiris' connection and role in the return of the Golden Age? Thank you so much. Marietta from New York. Hi, Marietta. Um, well, I do believe that a lot of the gods of mythology have returned in the form of star seeds. All the females out there, you, every single female out there that is a returned Starseed, a volunteer, 
you guys carry the archetypes of the ancient goddess, not just Mary, not just Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, Isis, Athena, as well as um, Aphrodite, uh, Hera, and all of the, you know, the goddesses of old. In like manner, all you mas masculine, divine masculines, carry the archetypes of Osiris, of Joshua, of Hermes, Trismegistus, of Zeus, of Hercules. We, guys, are the returned Elohim, right? As we activate our dormant DNA and we have these amazing supernatural powers, right? We are the ones everyone's expecting, guys. All right? It's not going to happen from outside of us. It's going to happen. It's going to be something that happens from within. So all of you people, all of the starseeds are the returned Elohim. And yes, Isis and Osiris uh, were the Egyptian, you could say, aspect of the balance between the divine masculine and the divine feminine. And um, let me see. Okay. All right, guys, I'm going to answer one more question, and then I'm going to exit tonight's live. So I'm just going to take a random question here. All right, Edward. Edward Kasarjane is asking, what is going to happen with the San Francisco Bridge? Generally is foreseeing something. What are your thoughts? And thank you. All right, so I'm going to share something with you guys. So the earth is going through a purification process. That's why I strongly believe that the solar flash is near. Each time the earth goes through a purging, we could say that uh, there are natural volcanoes that are going off everywhere. So I don't know if you guys have noticed, but in central California and parts of northern California, there's been semi-tsunamis right, coming into the inlands. That's because volcanoes are ready to erupt, and some of them have already erupted in the Pacific Ocean, in the inside the ocean. So um, we have to be careful. We, we have to... The best thing to do is to, what, meditate, get in alignment with your higher self. So when the earth changes take place, you will know where to go, all right? You will know where to go for those that are living in the coastlines. And I strongly believe that um, because of the fact that we are the most important planet right now and that everyone is working, and what I mean by everyone is all the interdimensionals, including Prime Creator and everything in between, is working for a steady and smooth transition into the new earth. Um, I do believe that the earth changes are only going to be felt by the wicked, not us, right? We're not going to experience any tsunamis or earthquakes. There is going to be a translation taking place very soon that is going to open up the gates for the terror earth and the just will walk through while the wicked are left behind. Well, that's my personal belief. <clears throat> um, I guess that's it. <sighs> All righty, guys. I just wanted to thank everyone for being here on today's live. Um, thank you so much. And please don't forget to subscribe. Uh, press the like button and share this video so that my channel can continue growing. Again, I am competing with my pirated channels, and one of them is up to 53,000 subscribers. So I just want to make sure that um, I get to 100,000 first before he does. Otherwise, I get taken out. So if you guys could help me and share this video with as many people as possible, and don't forget to subscribe. And um, yeah, that's it. We will see you Monday. What's today? Saturday, Sunday, Monday. No, we will see you Tuesday night, all right? Because Monday is New Year's Day. So we will see you Tuesday night at the same time. May the God force be with you all. Always.